Hey everyone, today's lesson is going to be on chapter 13 in the textbook. We're going to talk about covariant and contravariant evolution of vector and tensor fields. Uh, there's another section in there on co-rotational ones. We'll skip over that. I'd recommend reading it anyway. All right, so here we go. A vector, a spatial vector field F... <coughs> is said to convect with the body or convect as a tangent if there is a fixed vector field in the reference configuration so that f is equal to the deformation gradient times fr. So we have F, the spatial vector field is equal to the deformation gradient times FR, <coughs> the fixed reference configuration field. So we know that F is invertible. Uh, so, so another way of saying this is to say that um, FR is equal to F inverse acting on the spatial vector field F. Well, this is constant, as in it doesn't vary in time. So its time derivative has to be 0. with the time derivative of f inverse times f is equal to vector 0. <coughs> well, we can use the product rule on that. That is equal to the time derivative of f inverse, which is distinct from the inverse of the time derivative of f. Um, the time derivative of the inverse is always guaranteed to exist the inverse of the time derivative is not always guaranteed to exist. All right, so that's times f plus f inverse times the time derivative of f. All right, well, in a, a lesson or two or three ago, probably two, we came up with an expression for the time derivative of f inverse in terms of f and the velocity gradient. So we have that f inverse dot is equal to <clears throat> minus f inverse times the velocity gradient, the spatial velocity gradient. So we have that the vector 0 is equal to minus f dot, which is minus f inverse l times f plus, or rather that'll be capital F, f inverse f dot. So we can factor out the f inverse there. F inverse times minus L <coughs> F plus F dot. Well, this 
means that uh, this here has to actually equal zero since f is invertible. So f inverse has determinant of greater than zero and is also invertible. So we have f dot is equal to L f. <coughs> So when we say that a vector field convects as a tangent, we mean that it follows the same evolution equations as tangent vectors, you know, so like vectors that would be the tangent to curves. We showed that those evolved with f for a fixed reference configuration tangent, and we talked about how their rate of stretching and spin and everything goes with the velocity gradient and how their stretching really goes with the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. We talked about that, uh, oh, I want to say that was just, uh, that was two lectures ago, I suppose. All right. <clears throat> so we showed, or yeah, showed what it is to convect as a tangent. Um, next we'll talk about what it means to convect as a normal. So again, a spatial vector field F is said to convect as a normal if there is a fix, fixed uh, material vector field FR in the reference configuration, similar as before. But now it evolves with F inverse transpose instead of F. So that one goes f, the spatial one is equal to f inverse transpose fr. <coughs> and since f transpose and f inverse transpose are invertible, that would mean that fr is equal to f transpose f. <coughs> All right, well, FR is fixed, you know, so it doesn't vary in time. So that means that the time derivative of this has to be zero. So F transpose F whole thing time derivative is equal to vector zero. And that is equal to the time derivative of F transpose, which is also the transpose of the time derivative. F plus F transpose F dot. All right, well, we came up with an expression for the time derivative of F in terms of L, so we can take the transpose of that whole relation there, and we have that zero, the vector is equal to F transpose times L times f, so f dot transpose is f transpose l. And then plus f transpose f dot. You can factor out the f transpose. And we have l transpose we missed a transpose there. 
Yep, so L transpose F plus F dot. <clears throat> well, F transpose is invertible, so that means the thing inside parentheses has to be zero. So we have that F dot for a vector field that is convecting as normal is equal to minus L transpose times F. Before we talked about normal vectors transforming with F inverse transpose, but that kind of didn't do particularly great things in terms of the scale. Like it, um, <clears throat> it wouldn't, area vectors didn't transform that way. Normal vectors did. And that just gave you a vector that was normal to a surface given a vector that was normal to the surface in the reference configuration. Um, but that whole <coughs> determinant of S thing was important to get the area. But it turns out that F inverse transpose is an important mode of evolution as well. So let's get into that. Yeah, so, so like I said before, we talked about normal trans or vectors transforming with F inverse transpose. come back. But area normals go with that times the determinant of F, so the cofactor. But normal vector evolution by F inverse transpose is going to turn out to be useful. And it turns out to be useful in the sense that it is dual to tangent convection. So if F convects as tangent and G convects as normal, then their inner product is not going to vary with time. So if we look at f dot g, their time derivative, this is equal to f dot dot g plus f dot g dot. So that is equal to lf dot g plus f dot, or rather minus, F dot L transpose G. 
we can use the transpose to say that is equal to LF <coughs> dot G minus LF dot G, which of course has to be equal to zero. All right, this next part here, you're going to be so thrilled about, I'm sure. <clears throat> it, uh, it's like dual basis come back from the dead. You guys thought we were done with it after the talk on uh, vector and tensor algebra, but here it comes again. Um, and, you know, after this, it's not going to be directly a huge aspect of the rest of the course, but it will be a huge aspect of things that you'll run into in the literature if you look at any continuum mechanics-y stuff. All right, so we'll talk about a tangentially convecting basis and its dual basis and the covariant and contravariant components of spatial fields. <coughs> All right, so let's say we have a set of three spatial vector fields <coughs> that at any given point form a basis for the tangent space. So in other words, they span, you know, a volume. And let's say that they convect as tangent. So F subscript I is a set of three spatial vector fields and they convect as tangent. <clears throat> so there's a fixed triad of material vector fields <clears throat> where these fi are just the deformation gradient times those fixed material vector fields. So you have F I is equal to the deformation gradient times M I, which means that F I dot is equal to L F I. And let's say that F I dot F J cross F K is strictly greater than zero for all x and t. 
just to say that they form a basis at all points. Which is, of course, going to be the case if um, the M ones satisfy that, since F is invertible. <coughs> all right, well, we're going to denote F superscript I as the corresponding dual or reciprocal basis. We have an inner product, so it's safe to just call it the reciprocal one and identify that with the dual basis. So F superscript I be the corresponding dual basis. <clears throat> F subscript I satisfying the familiar relation of F subscript I dot F superscript J is equal to delta I J. All right, well, if that is equal to delta ij, <coughs> which is not a function of time, then the time derivative of this whole shebang over here has to be equal to zero. So f i dot f superscript j, whole time derivative, is equal to zero, is equal to f i dot dot f j plus fi dot fj dot. All right, well, we already showed what fi dot is because fi subscript there, this one, is a tangentially convecting one. So we can fill that in. 0 is equal to L <coughs> fi dot f superscript j plus f i dot f superscript j dot. All right, we're going to use the transpose. So that is equal to f i dot l transpose f j plus f i dot the time derivative of f j. Factor out the f i. And then the thing inside the parentheses there has to be equal to zero. So we have that f j dot, the time derivative of that dual basis element, has to equal minus L transpose times f j. So from that, we see that the dual basis to a tangentially convecting basis convects as normal. If we go back here, that's how <clears throat> normal convection happens. And sure enough,
All right, so from that, it follows that um, we have this. That f superscript i, the dual basis element, is equal to f inverse transpose times m superscript i, the corresponding dual basis element in the reference configuration, where the set m superscript i satisfies <clears throat> m subscript i dot m superscript j is equal to delta ij. So as we talked about in the vector and tensor algebra part, we can express components of vectors and tensors relative to whatever basis we want. So let's do that. So we're going to look at a spatial vector field G. G is equal to G superscript I, so contravariant, times F subscript I, covariant, which is equal to G subscript I, covariant, times F superscript I, which is contravariant. And likewise, we can do the same thing with any tensor field. <coughs> Call that spatial tensor field. Capital G. Yeah, capital G. That should be like my rap name or something, right? I'd probably be one heck of a rapper. All right, so that's going to be G <clears throat> is equal to G contravariant I J F covariant I tensor product F covariant J, which is equal to G covariant I J times F contravariant I tensor product F contravariant J. Uh, that is also equal to G contravariant I covariant J F covariant I tensor product contravariant J, which is equal to G covariant I contravariant J <clears throat> F contravariant I tensor product covariant J. <coughs> but we're pretty much, uh, we're only going to use the first two of those here. Um, these ones are kind of useful when you're making tensors and finding their components because you just need to have one basis and look at the results. But these ones are going to be what we're talking about here in terms of modes of evolution. All right, so the components with the superscripts are called contravariant in the sense that they transform against the 
the materially convecting basis F subscript I. And so what we mean by that <clears throat> is, um, like, for instance, if F subscript 1, the materially convecting basis vector, doubles, then G superscript 1, the contravariant component of the spatial vector field G in the direction of F1, well, that has to half. And so in kind of a reciprocal way to that, um, the subscript components are called covariant <coughs> because they change with the, uh, the materially convecting basis. So if F1 doubles, then the covariant component G1 also doubles. All right, so let's revisit pull back and push forward. So let's say that we have a spatial tensor field G. We can define it in components relative to the materially convecting basis or relative to its dual basis. So let G equal G covariant IJ times the contravariant basis or the dual basis which is equal to G's contravariant components times the tensor product of the material convecting basis elements. So that's a spacer te spatial tensor field. And let's define two material tensor fields using the two pullbacks that we bothered giving a name to of G. So say that M is equal to the pullback without the fancy line under it of G which is equal to F transpose G F. And let's say that N is equal to the fancy P with the fancy line under it. G <coughs> is equal to 
f inverse g f inverse transpose. So let's remember that our spatial basis and its dual basis are related to corresponding material bases that are fixed. So we have that the tangentially convecting F subscript I is equal to F deformation gradient times M subscript I. And <clears throat> normal convecting F superscript I is equal to, got that one wrong in the notes, that should be F inverse transpose, not F. F inverse transpose times M superscript i, the, you know, dual basis in the reference configuration, where the m subscript and m superscript satisfy m subscript i dot m superscript j is equal to delta i j. All right, well, these material tensor fields, m and n, can be expressed in components. So you have that M, <clears throat> the material tensor field, where that can be M with contravariant components times the original basis things here, MI, MJ, which is equal to M with covariant components times the dual basis tensor products. <coughs> And likewise, N is equal to its uh, contravariant components times the tensor basis of <clears throat> covariant tensor products, which is equal to N subscript IJ. Like that. All right, well, we can find those, uh, those components. So we have that the covariant components of M are equal to M subscript I dot M times M subscript J, which is equal to M I dot F transpose G <clears throat> F MJ by the definition of that <clears throat> pullback. All right, so that is equal to F inverse fi, that's what mi is, times f transpose g f f inverse f j. All right, well, the f and the f inverse are going to cancel out, so that is equal to 
f inverse f i dot <coughs> f transpose g f j. We can move the f inverse over using the transpose. That is equal to f i dot f inverse transpose, f transpose, g, f, j. So now the f inverse transpose and f transpose will cancel out. That is equal to f, i, dot, g, f, j. So m, i, j of this uh, material tensor field is equal to g subscript ij of the spatial tensor field. So this pullback, which we call the covariant pullback, preserves the comp covariant components of a tensor. All right, so now if we look at n, let's look at the contravariant ones because those are going to be the ones that matter there. n i j is equal to the dual basis m i dot n times the dual basis m j. <coughs> All right, and we can plug in the definition of the p underbar pullback, which will be, it turns out, the contravariant pullback. So that is equal to m superscript i dot <coughs> f inverse g f inverse transpose times m superscript j. And plug in our definitions of m i in terms of fi, so that is equal to f transpose fi, the dual basis one, dot, same thing, f inverse g, f inverse transpose f transpose F superscript J. <clears throat> All right, we can move that transpose over there. So that is equal to dual basis FI dot F inverse transpose, or rather F, uh, just F times F inverse g f inverse transpose f transpose f j well these two are going to cancel and these two are going to cancel so that is equal to f i dot g <coughs> f j so this one preserves the contravariant components of G. So a spatial tensor field is said to convect covariantly if its covariant pullback is a fixed 
material tensor feeler, so it doesn't vary in time. So there are three equivalent ways of this being a thing. So equivalently, the first is that the time derivative of g, so this is, you know, follow the, the material time derivative. So, you know, for a fixed material point, <coughs> hence the dot instead of the prime plus g l plus l transpose g is equal to the tensor 0 to the time derivative of the covariant pullback of g which is equal to the time derivative of F transpose G F is equal to the zero tensor. <coughs> and three, when expressed with respect to a materially convecting basis and its dual basis, we have this thing for the components So the time derivative of G's covariant components <coughs> is equal to zero. So on the other hand, one is said to a spatial tensor field G goes contravariantly if its contravariant pullback is a fixed material tensor field. And so that has also three equivalence definitions or relations kind of defining it. So the first one is G dot minus LG minus G L transpose is equal to zero. And the second is that the time derivative of the contravariant pullback of G is equal to zero. 
And the third is expressed, again, with respect to a materially convecting basis. <coughs> We have that the contravariant components, g, i, j, their time derivative is 0. All right, so that's it for those modes of evolution. Um, they'll talk about them a little more in some of the upcoming chapters in the textbook, um, especially when they <coughs> see where to go. I was just looking at that. Yeah, so in transformation rules for kinematic fields, so chapter 20, they'll go into pretty good detail about them. We'll cover 20 to some extent. Um, in the next lecture, we're going to cover probably chapters 15 and 16, and that'll be the end of our discussion of kinematics. That'll probably be like tomorrow or something. All right, remember the homework is due this upcoming Friday, the 20th. Hopefully it's not too difficult, um, and I'll catch you later on. Have a good one.